Um, obviously, it's been a very inspiring um, morning and day so far, so I want to thank um, uh, the organization for inviting me. And the bar is raised high, so I hope I can keep it up. Um, yeah, I'm Kirsten, and I uh, worked on my uh, I'm a dissertation research for the last three and a half years in the Netherlands. And I did soundscapes research in special needs care. And um, throughout my presentation, I will hopefully make clear what uh, we consider soundscape research, because I already noticed uh, yesterday evening that there are different people here with different definitions of soundscapes or soundscaping. Um, so I was doing research for uh, writing my dissertation, and I stumbled across the work of Florence Nightingale. Um, her seminal work on nursing, what it is and what is not, is now the basis of our modern day nursing. And her work was published in 1860. And she has a whole chapter based on noise and sound. And especially this quote struck me. She said, unnecessary noise is the most cruel absence of care that can be inflicted on sick or well. And here I found myself thinking, oh, that's just great. I'm reinventing the wheel 150 years later. Um, but she is right, and I think everybody here agrees that sound or noise has a great impact and we should pay more attention to it and its adverse effects. And I'm doing that with a very special group of people, people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities. And I want to sketch um, a little image in your heads of what these people actually are and look like. A profound intellectual disability entails that these people have an IQ not exceeding 25 points, which equals a developmental age of about 24 months. So we have people that um, have cognitive capacities not exceeding a two-year-old child. Next to that, they have severe motor disabilities. Sometimes uh, they're just not able to move at all, often they're wheelchair-bound, or their uh, freedom of movement is impaired due to severe epilepsy. Next to that, they have severe sensory disabilities. We see prevalences up to 85% of visual impairments. So you can assume these people are basically blind until proven otherwise. Next to that, we have prevalences of 30-40% of auditory impairments, so they often have impaired hearing. They have problems with their tactile sensories, olfactory. Basically, they have a really distorted way of experiencing the world. There are a lot of health problems with their digestion or uh, cardiovascular diseases. They have speech deficits. A lot of them are not even able to talk. So they have um, um, very diminished options of expressing their self, their feelings. And they have Logically, I think a lot of mental health problems, a lot of them are depressed or um, they show challenging behavior, which can be uh, auto-mutilation or aggressive behavior. You often see stereotypical movements, so they move or they shake in a certain way. But it can also be withdrawn, with, uh, withdrawn behavior, such as depressions, where they just shut down all, all contact they have with the world. And um, we put these people together in group homes and in daycare activities. And I want to let you listen to a couple of sounds I recorded there. So these are two people with PIMD, as we abbreviated. And um, I hope the sound will work. Yes. Hello. Mm. Mm. That could be desc uh, described as a typical sound they produce. They have some vocalizations. And they're often hard to interpret for us. But the other people that also live there, they are exposed to these sounds. This is also a sound we hear, if it works. No? Ah, yes. Can anybody guess what this is? Like a? A dryer. It's a paper shredder. Because some of these people actually like putting paper through a paper shredder the entire day and it is seen as an activity. 
Um, <laughs> but again, other people who live there are also exposed to these sounds. And lastly, <laughs> they also produce positive sounds. Luckily. Um, so these are a couple of sounds you hear all, all day in these facilities. And um, I researched what the effect was of their entire auditory living environments, uh, what the role is of sound in their lives, etc. And there hasn't been a lot of research done, actually none, with this specific group of people. We have some case studies on people with specific syndromes that are uh, experience hyperacusive, that are really sensitive to sound, but there wasn't no, there was not much to, to base myself on, so I went into the literature on the effects of noise on well-being in the normal population. And um, I found the effects were astonishing. I found this report by the World Health Organization, which shows that over a million healthy life years are lost every year. And then we're talking only in Western Europe and only because of traffic noise. So if you take into account uh, stress caused by... Um, uh, poor working environments or in the healthcare settings like we uh, were shown this, uh, this morning, we can imagine that this number will rise um, tremendously. And um, I was especially struck by the higher risks at cardiovascular diseases and um, stress and sleeping problems and there are a lot of effects that noise induce and this is often explained by the noise stress hypothesis. And the noise stress hypothesis states that noise acts as an unspecific stressor which activates our nervous system and therefore it affects our metabolism. Stress hormones like cortisol and norepinephrine, they rise and therefore we have all these negative effects such as higher rates of heart risks. But then I thought, yeah, okay, but why is this happening? Why is this noise stress hypothesis working in the way it does? So there is a missing link, and um, to get an answer on that, I think we need to look beyond acoustics. And I think it's a little bit blasphemy to say it here, but I think there are some people that agree when I say that I think that acoustics are a little bit overrated. <laughs> Even Florence Nightingale agreed, and she, was, <laughs> she said that it's uh, noise that creates an expectation in your mind uh, it, which um, is what hurts a patient. It's rarely the loudness or the effect upon the organ which appears to affect the sick. And here's where my kind of soundscape research comes into play. Soundscapes uh, were defined by Schaefer in 1977 as environments of sound with emphasis on the way it is perceived by an individual. So it depends on the relationship between an individual and an environment. And I think it was Nigel, I don't know where you are, but you said it also this morning, it's all about context and if we are in control or not. So I'm more um, interested in how people actually perceive soundscapes, auditory environments, because people are more than decibel meters and I think we should focus more on that. In soundscape research, there has been reached a consensus there's been a lot of research done in which they let people hear a lot of sounds and asked, what do you think of this sound? How would you describe it? And we found a consensus that soundscapes are um, appraised based on two main dimensions. Pleasantness, horizontally shown, and eventfulness on a vertical axis. And this closely resembles um, what in psychology is known as core affect. And core effect could be described as the, the heart of all affective experiences. It is what underlies emotions and moods. And core effect exists of two dimensions, pleasantness and arousal. So there was a striking similarity between how people appraise the world around them and how would they appraise or describe um, the feelings they have on the inside. So the feelings or behaviors um, that are elicited by those feelings are displayed on the inside, core effect on the inside, and appraisal of soundscapes on the outside. So we actually propose a classification or a taxonomy of soundscapes. Lively, calm, boring, or chaotic. A lively environment is eventful and pleasant. A calm environment is pleasant but uneventful. And on the negative side, we have chaotic and boring. 
and it is impossible to relax uh, in a chaotic environment and you need a lively environment with lots of affordances and interesting options that will grab your fascination to learn and to explore and to play. Um, again, I was left with this question, yeah, okay, so people ex um, appraise their environments based on pleasantness and eventfulness, but why is this happening? And we think that has to do with audible safety. Again, uh, like Nigel said this morning, our brain is tuned to um, savants and not office environments. Our current day auditory environments have changed tremendously over the last decades. There are more traffic sounds, more mechanical sounds. And we think that our brainstem, where sound is processed for a large part, is just not tuned to that yet. And um, if you go back to the evolution of audition, the capacity to hear and listen, you see that there's a really strong warning function. We still don't have eyes in the back of our head, but we can hear all around us. And sounds wake us up when we sleep. And we respond quicker to auditory stimuli than to visual stimuli. So we think there's a really important role uh, for sound to warn us for possible danger. And um, like I said, uh, sound is processed for a large part already in the brainstem. It goes unconsciously. And this brainstem decides whether you should pay attention to other alarming sounds in your environment. So we think sound is annoying um, as soon as it grabs your attention. As soon as you are no longer in control of your own thoughts, that's when this noise stress hypothesis kicks in. And this also explains why we see more visual impairments than auditory impairments in people with PIMD. Because their brainstem function, thus also their auditory processing, is more intact than the higher cognitive functions. Um, and this is a perfect example of an environment we consider audible safe. It is um, reassuring and not alarming in any way. So what does that mean for people who are not able to see, who are not able to speak, who are not able to express their emotions in a normal way, who are not able to hear, and on top of that have so low or so um, few cognitive capacities to actually understand and make sense of the world around them. So we started doing research in these living environments, in the residential facilities, and because we cannot ask these people to fill in a questionnaire or we cannot put them in an MRI scanner, uh, we depend on observations made by their direct support professionals. And we uh, followed uh, 30 participants an entire day and we asked um, their support staff to make observations of the quality of the auditory environment and of the core effect of these people. And we saw a significant relationship, as we predicted, as we think exists in everyone, between how uh, you appraise the world around you and how you feel on the inside. And this provided a basis for us to continue our research. So we did. And we developed a smartphone application. We called it Mozart, Mobile Soundscape Appraisal and Recording Technology. And uh, you could call it an in-situ experience sampling method. It basically sends the user a push notification two or three times a day. And, and it asks to make a recording of 30 seconds. And then you fill in a very short questionnaire uh, in which you say whether you think it's pleasant or not, eventful or not, chaotic or uh, calm or boring or lively. And with that, we saw, actually, we implemented this uh, at a couple of daycare facilities for only four weeks. We just gave the professionals this application. We didn't give them any instruction. We didn't teach them anything. We just let them work with this app for four weeks. And we saw that after those four weeks, um, the quality of the soundscapes improved and that the negative moods of the clients reduced significantly and also that their problem behavior they showed reduced significantly. So with very minimal efforts, we got really nice results. And um, then we did a last study, we call it soundscape sessions. Uh, we actually have a really nice word for it in Dutch, klankkast, but it doesn't translate uh, to English, so soundscape sessions. And uh, what we did was we had the opportunity to refurbish this room. This is actually a time-out room. 
I would call it an isolation cell. It's a horrible empty room which they put people to cool down. And I think if you have such reduced cognitive capacities and you don't understand the world and you're left alone with yourself in a room like this, we shouldn't do that. Anyhow, we were able to refurbish it and we turned it into this. We actually implemented an IKEA hack. Uh, we put Billy uh, bookshelves along the sides. We filled it with sound insulation material and we put a speaker set up in it all around. We covered it with some nice cloths and we put some chairs in it. And we let um, the people hear five, no, actually four different kinds of soundscapes which were designed by a sound designer in Groningen. And I hope it will work. Yeah. We had one condition in which we played ocean sounds of the beach. So it's really soothing. We had one condition in which we played sounds from a forest with some birds. And we also had a condition with slow tonal ambient music and uh, um, not too lively but cozy marketplace. And we saw that in all condition, um, the core effect of these people, it, it, um, how, how should I say it? They became relaxed in any condition. We haven't found um, much difference between the conditions yet, but interestingly, we also had a control condition in which we didn't play any sound. And even that showed to be a big improvement over their normal auditory environments, which are really loud normally. So the main results is there are currently is there's no attention for soundscape hygiene. People are banging doors. They put on the radio loudly the entire day because they think it's nice for the clients. And uh, we should do something about that. So raising awareness would be a very important first step, especially because we showed that the quality of the soundscapes is related to their moods and challenging behavior. Um, do I have, I have one minute, yes. For future research, I would love to include physiological measurements to make these observations more objective. So I'm really interested in Googling the uh, headset which measure, measures uh, brain waves. I will do that later. And also we think this is actually applicable to many long-term healthcare settings such as people with uh, autism or hospitals or elderly with dementia. And we're also gonna put all the recordings we made and the accompanied appraisals in a machine learning network so we can actually simulate and hopefully in the future predict how people would feel in certain soundscapes. And we're also doing it for municipalities so they can use it uh, in their event planning so people become less annoyed of all the concerts and food festivals that are going on right now. Yeah, that's my concluding slide. Like Florence Nightingale said, the fidget of silk and crinlin, the rattling of keys, the creaking of stays and shoes will do a, poor, um, a patient more harm than all the medicine in the world will do him good. Thank you very much. <laughs>